Hello, and thanks for joining us today. My name is Thomas Johnson. I'm the Curator of Performance and Moving Image at Dunlop Art Gallery and RPL Film Theatre. I'd like to acknowledge that uh, I'm a first-generation settler of Danish descent, growing up in Calgary, also known as Mokinstis, and now based in Oksana Kaasiteki, which is also known as Pile of Bones and also known as Regina, located in Treaty 4 territory, the traditional territory of the Nehewak, Soto, Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota, and the homeland of the Métis. On behalf of the RPL Film Theatre, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this discussion. Uh, first, a new monthly collaboration with CJTR Community Radio. Tonight, Zora Zahir will be in discussion with filmmaker Aisha Jamal. And by way of introduction, Zora Zahir is the co-host of Nave Ashena, a Persian language show on CJTR, and also the new vice president of the station. Her education and experience are a mix of many things. She's the poet, a poet and translator in her spare time. Last year, she was a manager at a children's magazine in Afghanistan. And finally, love of science makes up most of her time. Zora is a master of science in genetics and currently is a graduate student at the University of Regina. Also with us is Aisha Jamal, who is a filmmaker, programmer, and college professor. Her feature documentary, which we'll be discussing today, Akando Haraway, is now screening on CBC Gem, and she's currently working on a documentary web series with TELUS. Her previous short films have played at various international festivals worldwide. Currently, Aisha teaches part-time at York University and at Sheridan College in Oakville, Ontario. Uh, following the discussion today, there's gonna be opportunity for you to ask questions of our guests, and I encourage you to add these to the chat on the right-hand side. And now it's my pleasure to invite Zora to open this discussion. Oh, thank you, Thomas. Thank you, RPL uh, Film Theater. And it's a pleasure to have you, Aisha, here. Thank you, Zora. It's nice to be here. I know. I mean, like, I I had a discussion before with you uh, on CGTR, like, I think a year ago. And yeah, that was just awesome because it was the first, I think, few months that you're Kanda Haraway came out and I, I didn't have a chance that time to watch it, but this time I watched it and I loved it. So oh. I don't want to spoil much, but yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I'm so glad you liked it. Yeah, and I'm happy that it's now on uh, CBC Gem. So it was just so easy. You just go through the CBC Gem and we can find your yeah. uh, documentary. Great. Awesome. So I don't want to spoil both the movies. We are going to talk about the breadwinner first and then like going through uh, a kind of horror way, but so I'm not spoiling, but I'm going to ask some questions that Thank I'm you. curious to know. Yeah. Um, what was the first impression of this breadwinner that you watched it and what was, what, what came to your mind? Well, I think it was interesting to watch it um, as someone who's from Afghanistan, but who came to Canada before this Taliban period. Mm -hmm. So I was interested to see how somebody who's, not Afghan, because Deborah Ellis, the writer of the book, is not from Afghanistan, would depict, you know, Afghan children, the war, some of the really sort of complicated politics. You know, and I have to say, I was pleasantly surprised. I really um, liked watching the film. I thought it was difficult to see because it's not like a very, very, and I'm not giving anything away, but it's a heavy film because some of the themes are very heavy because it is about gender, it's about violence, it's about war, and it's about you know friendship and all of these things. Um, but overall, I think it gave me a lot to think about and I was really glad to see that I liked some of the representation. So in that sense, um, yeah, I thought it was a thought provoking film. I, I like it because you just actually said a very interesting thing that, you know, uh, in the trailer of the movie, they said that, is it a happy, mm, a happy story or it's a sad story? And that's something about the breadwinner, you know, till the end, you can't answer that question. Yeah. Yeah. And I think even after watching the end, you still feel <laughs> yeah. like, huh. Definitely. Yeah, you know, and I, t I watched it with somebody else and we talked a lot about it, actually. It gave us a lot to think about. Can you even make a film about this particular period in Afghan history that is, uh, you know, and the film takes place just before the American invasion, right? Sort of 2001, I would assume. Mm -hmm. So you, you kind of wonder, can you make a positive film about that? Can you make something that's hopeful about that? We all know what happens after, you know? That's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, 
we can go to the next slide. And actually, I want to know, because you are someone who left Afghanistan as a child, you said that, and you didn't see this era of Afghanistan. But what was something that you didn't understand as, you know, someone who left Afghanistan and who didn't see these things? Hmm. I mean, from watching the film or in general, I mean, I think, you know, generally speaking, when I was here and observing this period of time, there were so many things that I couldn't understand. Uh, and I had to do a lot of reading to sort of educate myself and understand where the Taliban come from. You know, why at this particular moment in time, how do they keep control and power of a population like this? Um, but when I was watching the film, there was one part that I was like, I must ask Zora, what is this? So I do remember when Delwand and... Um, Parvana go into she, you know, Shazia, Shazia, who's also Delwan slash because she plays yes. both characters. Um, she takes pa, um, Parvana into a. It looks like a factory, but mm -hmm. it, in the, it's through these little red rocks, and they're shoveling them and they collect them off the ground. What is that? Wow, what a question! I don't know. <laughs> the candy. I, I thought that they are like the because you know Afghanistan is a mining country you know the country so I my understanding at that time was they are like you know expensive rocks and they are just searching you know around them and then they take some of them so because they are, can sell them because you cannot probably sell candy at that time but you can sell those like, expensive stones. That's what I was wondering. I was like, what is that? I really don't know. Like, is this something that people know in Afghanistan? And because I left as a child, I just don't know. <laughs> I'm like probably I'm wrong. So, you know, people can correct me, but I think they were like expensive stones. I don't okay. know. <laughs> okay. uh, you tell lots of things that I will come back to those things that you said that you research, uh, you know, about Afghanistan and those times. So I will come to that. But as a filmmaker, what do you think, how the story, you know, of the movie just flow? What was something that, you know, you think that you just really impressed by this, this is this mm -hmm. storyline? You know what? I mean, I think I was impressed overall. I thought it was going to be a chronological story about this girl who has to dress as a boy to help her family survive. But then I was so pleasantly surprised to see that they interwove another storyline. And that storyline is set up, and I know we're going to talk about this a little later, but like a little bit like A Thousand and One Nights, you know, this continuous story that sort of intersects our main storyline. And um, it was beautifully done because the animation changes in that story. And then the animation looks a little bit more like sort of like paper puppets. And I thought, visually speaking, um, I really enjoyed that. I thought it was beautiful. But I also thought that storytelling wise, that was a wonderful way to also acknowledge how stories are told in a different part of the world. So, um, so as a filmmaker, I thought interweaving these two storylines was really strong and it was beautifully done. So for me, that was really kind of meaningful. And also coming back to some of the hints and, and not giving you everything up front. Sometimes I think you have an urge to want to explain everything to your audience. Yeah. And in this yeah. film, they don't explain to you what happens to Suleiman, the brother, until mm -hmm. we're much further into the film. And I thought that storytelling wise, very well done. We keep hinting at him. We keep understanding there used to be a brother and we don't know what happened to him until we're sort of like almost towards the end. So there's a lot about the storytelling and the pacing that I loved, in the interweaving that I loved, that I thought was well done. That was awesome. So, I mean, like, I don't know if you know Deborah Ellis or not, but she is actually the writer of this um, book and the same name, The Breadwinner. And I was searching about her and she was now have like a organization, nonprofit organization, um, Canadian woman for Af women in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And that was something I was just like thrilled by her that, you know, how someone from Canada just, you know, involved in Afghanistan life, thinking about them and, you know, writing such a powerful uh, uh, book. What mm -hmm. do you think like, Deborah Ellis, do you think that how well she knows the culture? I mean, I, just like watching this this mm -hmm. movie, what do you think about her? I mean, do you yeah, know I guess you're asking about, you know, culturally speaking, does it resonate for someone who is Afghan, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. I do think that there were some things that I thought were interesting that um, kind of understood the period a bit better. I mean, 
probably there's some things that I think the film doesn't catch, but for example, you know, when I watched the film, I could, she was mentioning landmines, for example, or you saw them playing in these burned out Soviet tanks, mm -hmm. which is part of like the scenery of, you know, Kabul on the outskirts, you know? Um, so there were sort of like details like that that I thought were really interesting and well done that, you know, was someone from who is from there would understand. Or even when they're walking and she says, don't go off the path, you need to, because there might be landmines. And I remember that from being visiting Afghanistan in 2006 and everyone always telling me, do not go from, <laughs> do not stray from where we are walking because there might be mines. So these little details that when you're there that, you know, a part of your daily reality or part of your landscape, and I thought that was so well done that you captured some of that. Awesome. So you went to Afghanistan, like for the first time in 2006? Uh, since we've come here, yeah. The first time mm -hmm. I went back was in 2006, yeah. Oh, so now I want to ask you that, what is your advice for a Canadian that they want to know more about the culture of Afghanistan? I, we all heard about like the war and all those things, but what about the culture? How to know Afghanistan better? I think the one way we can know Afghanistan better is probably through literature or film. And I think that that would be really great. I mean, there's a new film that came out that was partially um, done by the National Film Board of Canada called Forbidden Real. And that film is about the history of cinema in Afghanistan. And you get to see a whole other face that's mm -hmm. not about war. You get to see the, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and what kinds of stories they used to tell and what kind of humor you see in Afghanistan and you know, um, the different kinds of directors. And I thought that's a wonderful film to sort of expand your horizon beyond understanding as if all there's ever been in Afghanistan is war, which is not true. So I think also, you know, do, reading about Afghanistan, you know, for example, The Kite Runner is a book that is written by an Afghan. Mm -hmm. So you get a lot of sort of some of the cultural nuance from him in the book. So I think like literature and film can really sort of give you more cultural understanding of Afghanistan. And thankfully now you can kind of Google a lot of this stuff and find yeah. it. You know? I love that you just said about like literature because Afghanistan is a land of storytellers. I mean, like we all grow up, our parents just tell us a story about anything, like from animals that you are going to learn something about it to just like, Shahrazad that you just said about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, I think every single Persian people know about Shahrazad. Shahrazad is someone who was so intellectual. She was a noble person. And she was saying all this story for 1001 night just to survive. It was not something like out of like fun or something. She has to just keep that king interested yeah. to, you know, to just like survive. And she knew like philosophy, she knew history, she knew mm. all these things. And then you come to see like this kind of movies and you say, yeah, I mean, like probably Deborah knew a lot about the literature of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Or like, I guess Sherazad is, you know, I guess Persian literature in a sense, um, and it's often called Arabian Nights and sort of more associated with um, Arab culture in a way. But yeah, you're right, because I think that's sort of the story that keeps going, right? And then everyone keeps asking um, Parvana to tell the next part of the story. Mm -hmm. And it just seems like it keeps, the it keeps our main storyline going as well. So it's this sort of idea that stories are what keep us alive and that give us meaning. And that comes True. across a lot. Uh, next slide is is actually something that you said, you know, in this movie, it, you just show the puppets and like how they, uh, how they show the reality and the real life and then the story part of it. That was just very kind of, you know, a brilliant idea, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then the next slide is also our a uh, famous book, 1001 Night. It's written in Persian and it has many, many uh, versions of it. Talking about Shahrazad and all, I think you also did the same thing in Kandahar Bay. The way you started, I mean, I, I think, I mean, like, yeah, you're surprised, but the way you start telling your story, I know it was a documentary. I think, I know it was not supposed to be something like a story, but you were like Shahrazad. I mean, uh, we can, <laughs> show the next slide and yeah so what do you think about that do you think that you were <laughs> well in a way you're right i'm giving the story a frame right because i'm the narrator of it and i'm the one who guides you through the whole thing and through the different chapters so yeah i think if you're thinking about how i set up the story you could perhaps say that you know that i become 
a character myself, but I'm also sort of the person who gives you and guides you. Yeah, I mean, you were the, I mean, your dad was the main character, but at the same time, it was you that you are the one who gave all this connection between the past and present and yeah. us. I mean, like you actually enter us to your life. Right. Have you ever think about that you are going to make this kind of film that, you know, showing your family? What, what, I mean, like, is it coming out of a sudden or mm. it was planned? You know what? Actually, so right, it was a little bit all of the sudden. Well, OK. What happened is that I heard from my brother, not from my dad, not from my mom, that my dad had bought this land. And I remember <laughs> thinking, wait, what? And I thought it was such a ridiculous idea that my father wanted to buy land in a place called Kandahar, Saskatchewan, that I Googled the place and I found a Wikipedia page and it had just sort of an empty field. <laughs> and I thought, ha, this is such a strange idea. And every time I would tell anyone, oh, I'm going to inherit farmland or like, you know, empty land in Saskatchewan, everyone goes, that is so crazy. And that there's such a place as Kandahar. After getting many reactions from people, I was like, oh, I think there's something here. Everyone thinks it's funny. Everyone wants to hear more. So I thought about, huh, what could I do with that? And I thought, you know, since I'm in film, I wanted to make a short film maybe. And then I started thinking about the idea of making a film. And because my dad is the one who bought this land and who I think I couldn't understand why he would do that, <laughs> that in some ways became my central character. That's true. So, and uh, next slide is your dad, the the star of the the f film. Actually, how hard was it to capture your dad and your family? How how hard was that? Well, before I made this film, I have made a film about my parents' garden. They have a really beautiful, huge garden when they used to live in Scarborough. And this garden won an award because it was really beautiful and big and it helped to beautify the neighborhood. So I made a film about my both my parents and this garden and I showed it in, in many different festivals and my parents came. And then every time the Q&A would start and people would ask me questions, I would point out my parents and they would get up and they would wave and they started to really love it. And then my mom would give garden advice after the film. You know, people would say to her, Amina, your flowers look so great. How do you do it with your roses? And my mom would go, well, with roses, you have to do this, this. So they really start to enjoy that interaction with the audience. So it's easy to somehow convince them that we now needed to make a bigger film. <laughs> so they had already, you know, been part of this little film and they've enjoyed how much it traveled around the world. And, you know, so for them, they were very proud of that interaction and that film. So then I talked to them about wanting to make this film. And then it was a bit harder to convince some of my other siblings, you know, because it's a little, you know, it's hard to see yourself on camera and to want someone to follow you around and to, you know, take you to another place and then keep asking you, how do you feel? What do you think? So I don't think every member of my family was like loving it, but they all agreed, which is really nice. That was interesting. Next slide is actually one of those scenes that, you know, you have like a very intense discussion, not like in terms of verbally, but in terms of like, you know, the feeling and emotions. And I was just like saying, wow, Aisha is very brave that she show also these things. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just thinking, I can never do that. <laughs> you know, what do you think? I mean, like, how was that? You know, I think, I don't know if it's brave or stupid. <laughs> it was brave. <laughs> Definitely brave. Um, I guess I thought about the fact that I am making a film and I'm trying to be honest. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, there were a few other moments we didn't show in the film that we cut out, you know, that were like also about family conflict. But then I thought, okay, those are like a little bit more private moments. But I thought we do need to understand that like all of us don't agree with my father, that there is some tension around my dad's decision to buy land there. Um, and that the way that he justifies it, that not all of us children understand and that we sort of have a hard time sometimes understanding my father, you know, mm -hmm. um, as a person. And, you know, we know him in one way, but don't know him in another way. So I think it was an honest conversation we were having and I had to ask myself, like, what does this add to the film? And I thought in a way, you know, it does explain some of the dynamics in the family. So with each scene, you ask yourself, how does it drive the story forward? Like, do I need this information or not? You know, so I think in this way, I thought in this conversation, we needed it. I want to ask something about your dad, but before that, do you think that this 
documentary about your family actually was a conversation with your dad you know so he was watching he he, he probably watched this and understand and learn a lot about his children yeah and i think i learned a lot about my dad making this film i think sometimes i think i made the film to try to understand my dad better you know i get very frustrated with my father when i'm with him in real life you know because sometimes it's really difficult because we agree on some politics we don't agree on some other politics and my father is very argumentative and i'm very argumentative because i'm his daughter so in a way it's sometimes hard to talk to him about certain things and i thought having the camera gave me a layer between me and my dad and allowed me to like look at him for longer and to have more patience and to ask more questions so in a way the film was also for me to understand him but i think my father watching the film understood us somewhat better as well so i think that it goes in both directions you know that was that was really interesting because when i watched this movie so i you know i got emotional first <laughs> because your dad uh, like face is very very similar to my dad i will show one of his picture later but he, he, and and i couldn't understand my dad a lot but when you show your dad and you start to talk about him and he was talking about like you know his uh, homeland and all these things that you know as uh, you're here we can see your sister i forgot his her name hasina 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 was saying that you know it's all about him and his past and his memories and then i was just thinking about my dad and it really helped me to understand what all those you know frustration that he as an immigrant just like faced and all and that was just very interesting you know it was just yeah it was just not you understanding your dad it helped me a lot i'm pretty sure oh. like it will help lots of people <laughs> that's really sweet yeah i think we showed the film at the peterborough film festival and there was a woman in the audience who wrote me i sat next to her but we didn't talk obviously during the film and then she wrote me a message via facebook after and she's chinese canadian and she was saying oh it's interesting your film's really making me think about and understand my my chinese canadian immigrant family and i was like oh that's so cool <laughs> like you're from a different culture, but you also feel a little bit of this separation between yourself and your father and this frustration with your father. So, yeah, it was kind of really great to hear that. Yeah, I mean, like, as a, you know, I think I, I, I want to recite one of uh, a famous uh, Persian poet, Shafi'i Ketkani. Mm -hmm. He has a, uh, I'm going to first say it in Persian that it says, A kosh adami batanash ra hamchun banafshah ha mishud it says that I wish human beings could take their homeland like violets wherever they go. Mm -hmm. And and when he sings this, I mean, like when he say these things and you suddenly realize, oh my God, you know, homeland for lots of people means a lot, means like their history, their culture, their all those things that they suddenly fall for like and they search for it in every moment in every aspect of even if they're in canada or china or like anywhere in the world they're searching for something at exactly what your dad did in kandahar yeah i think you're right and i think like you know and you have to remember that my father maybe like your father didn't leave afghanistan because he wanted to he didn't emigrate mm -hmm. because he was like let's live somewhere else and see what the lifestyle is like. It was more like, well, this is a country that's at war. It's a country that's like, my kids have no future here. And actually it's very unsafe. So for them, it was like um, um, issue of life and death to leave. So in that sense, I think that my father, you know, was so attached to Afghanistan and so attached to his memories and to his life because the rupture and the leaving was so violent. It wasn't so like out of choice, it was out of necessity. So I think understanding that about my father makes me and be more kind when I listen to him about his memories of Afghanistan and how everything reminds him of it. And so in a way, you know, he's always somehow halfway in between these two countries. And Hasina, again, in these things, he's, she's saying something that, you know, that the, the Afghanistan that your dad lived was very different than the Afghanistan of the current Afghanistan. What do you think about that and what is your view about like you know what your dad says and then you compare with like current afghanistan is it very similar or it's different i mean it's very different because my father's memories are of afghanistan at, at peace you know it's his memories of afghanistan when he was a child and my father was a kid 
in the in this I would say 60s, right? So it's a very different Afghanistan. It's not at war. Um, my father was able to roam more. He was able to travel across the country. And my father's always been very curious. So he would take road trips. Um, and, you know, he really loved to read about the, you know, history and so on. So that's not very possible today. You know, if you're a young man in Afghanistan, you know, it's not the same life. It's not a carefree existence. It's not, you know, it's tougher um, there's a constant threat of war and there's these big political shifts that have been happening and there hasn't been peace for a very long time, for long stretches of time even. So I think it's not the same place. So when my father talked about it beforehand, I always used to be, that's not the Afghanistan that I know. Yeah. It's not the Afghanistan of my childhood and it's not Afghanistan of 2006 when I went to visit. So there's a real separation between the two. That's true. Yeah. I mean, like, uh, I, the first time when I visited Afghanistan, it was 2004. And definitely, like, in during, like, six years that I was living there, it was a very deep, I mean, like, you could see the change. But at the same time, there's something always that you just, you know, you want to compare with the past, then you can't, you know what I yeah. mean? And definitely, like, Afghanistan 2021 probably is just very, very different that, that, that even from my understanding. When did you come to Canada, Zora? Uh, it's been two years and a half, but for a long time I was in India. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah, so probably we should talk, talk about like another Indian movie, which is like, I found it like Indian movie layers. I mean, it has made different layers and something that we all know about the Bollywood is not actually like one of only like, you know, movies that we can talk because there's like lots of, but I'm not going to talk about that. But yeah, <laughs> it was, <laughs> I, I left Afghanistan in 2011. Okay, so you've been yeah. here a long time then. Yeah, but I, yeah, my memory was just like so different. Um, and yeah, Saskatchewan. I mean, like, I love Saskatchewan. So, <laughs> I mean, like, everyone, like, saying, like, you know, it's a, as a, even I think your sibling says that they are urbanized and, you know, they like yeah. city, big cities and all. Yeah. But I'm, like, so much in love with Saskatchewan because, as you just, like, show, I mean, like, suddenly there's a surprise, like, a, like, a, town named Kandahar like you yeah. know what I mean yeah. or this couple of days ago it was plus 20 and today is like minus five and it's wow so <laughs> and it's I mean like everyone cleaned their cars if all we washed the yeah. like, streets and everything and now it's just like two three inches like snow and snowing and snowing and wow. the, I mean it's Saskatchewan. So what was your impression of Saskatchewan? You know what? It was so weird because before I went, my dad kept saying, Saskatchewan reminds me so much of Afghanistan. And I was like, oh, what's he talking about? How is that possible? <laughs> it's the middle of Canada. And then when I went, I actually was like, huh, actually, it's like some of the colors did remind me of Afghanistan. So a golden color, a, bit of, a little bit of green here and there, these sort of you know, blue skies with a certain kind of clouds. Although Afghanistan is more hilly, Saskatchewan yeah. is very flat. Flat. <laughs> but I was surprised about how much I actually liked Regina and Saskatoon. I also visited the two the two big cities, and it was kind of fun to discover the restaurants of Saskatoon or to like walk around the parks of Regina. So, in a sense, it was like so wonderful to discover this part of Canada that I don't know. So. My dad also gave me that gift, you know, to be able to go to Saskatchewan so many times for shooting and to get to know the different cities and the different places. Like, that was wonderful. You know, I wouldn't want to move from the big <laughs> giant city because okay. I love big urban settings, but I really appreciated it visiting. And I really thought it was so great to see how different Saskatchewan is. Yeah. You just mentioned that your dad says about, you know, these two, I mean, like Afghanistan and Saskatchewan, which is... I mean, obviously, Afghanistan now in the war is just so different than any other countries around the world. But like poppy flower was something that even you showed in the movie. And that was like, wow. I mean, like, that's a that's a great symbol if you want to make any memorial about any human being in these two countries. And both of them, you know, like, you know, the poppy flower, I don't know if you ever heard of that famous... Persian poet about like say man azadam khodruyam khodbuyam so it's just actually basically it just says that i'm i'm a free 
poppy flower and I just grow and I just like smell just all by myself. And it's exactly like, you know, about these two countries that two places that, you know, people trying to survive, people trying to just make sense, people trying to have a voice and contribute to their community, exactly like poppy flower. What do you think yeah. of that? And why they didn't choose that? <laughs> that ah, in memorial. Well, one, I didn't know it. I wish I knew you and you could have told me. But <laughs> secondly, I think that's actually such a nice idea because in a way, you're right. When we talk about the memorial my father wants to build and we talk to the architects, they'd kind of point out what are the things that unite Saskatchewan and Afghanistan, right? Being that's able true. to make yeah, and I think poppy flowers was one of the big things that they brought up. And it's interesting how they have different meaning in both countries because in Afghanistan, poppy flowers, sure, you could have some poetry about it and so on, but it's also like a big cash crop, yeah. right? So <laughs> yeah. it's different than here where the significance is much more Remembrance Day and war and November and like poetry. So That's so true. Yeah, but it would have been nice to unite the two around the symbol. Yeah, I mean, the first, the, I think you also mentioned that you like that memorial, you know, the one that, you yeah. know, it has like lots of uh, poppy flowers and that was yeah. just awesome. I thought, wow, that's it. I mean, like everyone should accept that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that you understand. It wasn't everybody's favorite. <laughs> so is there any, going to be any sequel? Because there's no memorial. <laughs> Ah, well, you know, COVID has changed a lot of things and it's kind of slowed down even the plans of a memorial. So will there be a sequel? Well, not right away, but you know, wouldn't it be nice to make a sequel maybe five, 10 years down the line? <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll so maybe then. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully the pandemic is over. Hopefully my yeah. dad has done some work on the memorial. Who knows? You know, my family might look a little different. So you all move back to Saskatchewan. I mean, like, oh my goodness, can you move. imagine? <laughs> we will be happy. Well, I mean, I don't know how we'd survive the winters. I already complained so much about Toronto winters that I'm not sure I could do Saskatchewan winters. You were just asking the question how can you survive minus 50? I mean, like, easily. <laughs> Sora, you are a good advertisement for Saskatchewan. <laughs> no, but like, seriously, I mean, like, I know that it sounds crazy but minus 50 doesn't feel like that you know that you think can i just bring you back <laughs> well i have experienced minus 20 in toronto okay. all the time and mm. you know it's not fun for me but <laughs> <laughs> i believe i was displaced i should start making films about tropical locations <laughs> oh my god <laughs> that's funny I mean, like here, I think in Saskatchewan, people like kind of like sunny weather, obviously. But yeah, I appreciate snow. And I, I really love like, you know, cold weather. And like, you know, because a little bit cold, you don't know what to wear. But if it's cold, so you know, you just prepare yourself. You just like, you know, you, you were never overdressed. But in like minus 10, you will always overdress. So I guess it's true. <laughs> also, we come from a four season country. Afghanistan has all seasons, right? Winter included. So, mm -hmm. you know, from Kandahar in the south, we get snow. I mean, we get a lot of snow. So sometimes people imagine you're coming from a desertous country and you're like, no, we, no. we also experience cold, we experience hot. And I would rather be from a very hot country, but. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, so do you want to tell us a little bit about your next project? Yeah, I'm actually working right now on a web series and it's a very strange subject that's actually kind of appropriate for the pandemic. But I'm working on a series about death and dying. And it's about um, sort of new innovations in the field of death and dying. So I'm looking at, for example, this new, it's a series, it's eight, eight episodes. They're only about five to six minutes long each one. And they're going to live on the web. So it's a web series. And it's basically about um, sort of new fields. For example, you know, one episode focuses on what is a death doula. Another one focuses on the use of like psychedelics and the treatment of death anxiety. So it's very different than wow. this one. <laughs> <laughs> In a way, it does not relate. <laughs> I know what, how you come up with this idea suddenly. I mean, like, was it in your mind or? You know, I was at the library working and I really wanted to avoid doing my work. And then I heard that they were having something called a death cafe. And I wow. thought, huh, what is a death cafe? And then I thought, that's a great way to spend an hour not doing my work. 
So I went to the death cafe and the, the woman who ran it was a death doula. And she was talking about her work and she was talking with the whole room full of people. And like there were about 40, 50 people. And some of them, I was the youngest person. Everybody was much older. Some people were dying. Some people had, you know, someone who had died in their lives and others were just old and thinking about dying. And the conversation they were having was so fascinating. And sometimes it was funny, sometimes it was sad, but it really made me think about how talking about death is not normal in our mm -hmm. society. That's we don't talk true. about it openly. We use words like someone passed away or we say they're no longer here, but we don't say they died because that's considered yeah. too direct. And you think, but that's exactly what happened. <laughs> so I was really interested in maybe working with this death doula on a short film and then tell us announce this web series and I applied for it and we got, we got the funding to make the whole series. Wow. I mean, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, like I was just want, about to ask you, did you scared? But then you said, yeah, you just try to normalize this word, right? <laughs> yeah. You try to sort of normalize the conversation around it and that you can ask direct questions about it. And there are sort of different ways of, you know, in the West, um, unlike Afghanistan, I think in Afghanistan, people are much more interactive with death in the way that, you know, you have to wash the body before and you have 24 hours to put it in the ground. We don't use caskets. We don't put makeup on. We don't put clothing on. We wrap somebody in a white sheet and you go straight into the earth. In the West, there is all of this intervention that makes it almost seem abnormal. Like you put in a wooden casket, they put makeup on you, they pump you full of chemicals. And it's like death has become so institutionalized and it costs so much money. And mm -hmm. I kind of was thinking about who's really trying to get away from that in the West. So there's sort of all of these new developments of trying to make it more an acceptable part of life. What about the, the only thing we all share in yeah. common, common? We're all going to die. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> definitely. Regardless yeah. of who we are. <laughs> I mean, what about the grieving part? I mean, like when your dad talk about in Kandahar way, he actually mentioned briefly that, you know, his parents died like in Pakistan. Yeah. So, but uh, I found it, wow. I mean, like it was, it was like, I think your dad grieved enough and then mm -hmm. he's just understand that reality. But yeah, lots of our parents, I mean, like our elders and all, they never passed that. How do you feel about that one? And but do you think that you, you show, I mean, like the difference between Afghanistan and like West, how they grieve and how they come up? Okay, we accept the reality now. <laughs> um, you know, do you mean in my show or in the film? Because I think you're right. My dad does talk about having this grief for his parents and never having been able to be there yeah. with them to sort of live through their end together. Um, but I mean, in the in the web series, we talk a lot about also what people can learn from ancient cultures or from other cultures, like, you know, what can Buddhism give you in terms of mindfulness? What can indigenous sort of ritual and ceremony teach you about keeping the dead alive through ceremony and so on. So I think it's important to think about what you learn from other cultures mm -hmm. about grief, because I think we don't really, people in the West want you to hurry through grief. And, you know, sometimes if someone has passed away three years ago, they're like, why are you still crying about that or thinking about <laughs> that? But it's like, no, it's, there's a different speed to it, a different stages to it. And sometimes you're back at square one, so all these things that you can learn from really looking at how other places deal with, you know, life and death. I like it. Yeah. I mean, like the culture, I mean, obviously the culture makes lots of, you know, meaning in terms of like death culture, probably. But yeah, I remember, for example, I lost my uncle, like probably like, 11 12 years ago but they didn't told me i mean like he was in iran as an immigrant he was just like doing some of his stuff and they never told me and they told me like four years later and mm -hmm. still i feel like i didn't have the chance to grieve and that that pain is still like I, it just like hit me you know what i mean i mean like that kind of like culture okay you just saw the dead body and then you just grieve it for seven days or something and then okay I accept the reality, but I didn't never had that chance. I'm just thinking that what other people just feel about it. I mean, if, if, when your dad, I don't oh, know. I mean, yeah. Like, because, yeah. 
Yeah, you're right. I guess it's like when you have to grieve from afar, you never get to be there to see the body or to say goodbye or to take part in the ritual as a community. It must be so very hard. And I think that's, you know, and I, and I thought about that as well after I watched the film and I thought, you know, what a gift it is for me to be able to grow up and to grow old with my parents in the same city and being able to see them. And, you know, my siblings all ended up in Toronto as well. And, you know, we we all have partners. Some of my siblings have children and we all get to see my parents. We all get to, my parents are really good grandparents. They And for them to have that gift of being close to us and my father didn't have that. And my mother didn't have that because of war. Yeah. And because his parents were in a refugee camp or because my mother's mother died young or even the fact that my mom has lost her sister more recently and she can't go back easily. Mm -hmm. Like Afghanistan is not one of those places where you just buy a ticket and go, I'm just going to go back for about a week and I'm going to take <laughs> part in this funeral. You don't do that. Mm -hmm. it's you far, can't do that even. <laughs> no, you can't. It's a huge headache to have to plan to go to Afghanistan. So I think I appreciated that thinking about my parents in that way and thinking, you know, my dad did not get that chance to mm -hmm. grow old with his parents. I like that. I'm going to ask Thomas that how much time we still have and if there are any question from the audience or something. Um, I don't know. Okay, we have 15 minutes. Perfect. Um, so I going to show you the next slide. Still, we are talking about Saskatchewan, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. We'll come back to Saskatchewan. So there's, yeah, so there's like three pictures here that you can see. So can you tell me which one is Kandahar, Afghanistan, and which, oh which one is Kandahar, Saskatchewan? <laughs> oh, my God. I love that you're doing this. The top right-hand corner is... The big one? Yeah, it's Afghan. No, the one um, with the red bushes in it yeah. is... <laughs> Afghanistan. Are you sure? Probably not. Is that Saskatchewan? Oh my God, it's a really good game. They're just proving the fact that they are very much alike. Well, the big photo is Afghanistan. Okay. How do you and know that? I'm yeah, just, I mean, like, I've, I've never seen a river like that in Saskatchewan. We have a river. I mean, like, I, Saskatchewan. Me. <laughs> I know, Saskatchewan. I've seen the in Saskatoon, I've seen the river. Yeah. But I just imagine I've never seen a river like that. In a I photo. think, uh, yeah, Saskatchewan is coming from a, an indigenous word, Saskatchewan, something like that means rapid, rapid swift. So it was like a land of this like rapid waters and all. So yeah, we have. <laughs> we have. So is that a <laughs> or is that Saskatchewan? <laughs> I'm not telling you. What about the last one? The, the, the one, bottom on the, one? I think, yeah. isn't that Kandahar, Saskatchewan? <laughs> that's an aerial <laughs> photo of Kandahar, Saskatchewan. Yeah, yeah that's me, true. Zora. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's Kandahar, Saskatchewan. But uh, you, what is your other one? Those two are Afghanistan? No, I th okay. I think the one with the red bushes is Saskatchewan and the big one is Afghanistan. Okay, so you were right at the first <laughs> I only judge by your expression. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Something about like uh, Afghanistan is that obviously like, there is hills and all, but those tiny hills can can you you know can you can see it in Saskatchewan, but yeah, but both of them were Afghanistan. The only one down was Saskatchewan. <laughs> well done. It's a good game. <laughs> I, I, I even had like more time probably I research more, but yeah, I mean like they were really similar to each other and. When I was searching, I said that now it is like these pictures, good pictures shows that, you know, the natures and all. And honestly, you cannot say where it is in the world because it's nature. It's just beautiful. It's water and all green. But yeah, I like it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's beautiful. Actually, that's probably what my dad really loved about Saskatchewan is that it was in a way for him to. I mean, he talks about it too the first time he arrived there, you know, that it reminded him so much of where he was from and he could sort of see his own landscape and project onto it his memories that's true where do you have imagine that after this covid and all do you have another trip do you want to come back and think about your land or like it's something that you probably think about it like 20 years later you know um i guess you know i often get asked what's happening to the land and if we're doing <laughs> anything with it and i think covid has kind of stopped any plan making that's and true. like 
you know, I was kind of busy with the release of the film. You know, the last festival it played at was March 6th in Belleville. So that was only one week before the lockdown started. And then there's been like, it just went to, it went to CBC Gem. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's showing on TV as well. So I don't really have, um, everything kind of just stopped. Everything with the film stopped and everything with planning the memorial or even thinking about the memorial has stopped. So I don't know when it's all going to start up again. And, you know, will there be any any interest left? I have no idea. Uh, are you still in contact with people in uh, of Kandahar, Saskatchewan? I mean, like those 15 people. I mean, like, uh, how is that, that going? And how what happened after this movie comes out? And what was the reaction? Well, um, uh, my producer, Deborah Parks, was in touch with some of the people from Kandahar in December. She sent, I think, a couple of little gifts, which is nice, to Francis and to also Dennis. Last time I spoke to them must have been last summer. Uh -huh. And um, Dennis was saying that a lot of his friends and his family had seen the film, that everyone is calling him a big movie star. Oh. <laughs> And which was really sweet. Um, and I got a few messages via our Facebook page from some of the members of other people's families, which was really nice, saying that they enjoyed the film and they loved seeing it through the eyes of the camera. So it sounds like, I mean, I should definitely get in touch again to see how they've been doing in the past sort of half year or so with the pandemic. But um, so I would love to see them again. So I think if I come to Saskatchewan for whatever reason in the future, I will definitely make a stop in Kandahar to see them. I love that you should just say, yeah, I mean, let's stop in Kandahar. Of course, I'm in Kandahar. What was their first impression? I mean, like when you saw, when you told them, hey, I'm I'm going to make this movie, are they well all in board or like there were just some concern? What was the the first like impression of people of Kandahar, Saskatchewan, when you well, told you know, them? I was really surprised at how friendly everybody was. So even though they might not want to be on camera, they were willing to talk to me. And I was able to ask questions about um, the history of the place, why they ended up there. Um, so that was really nice to be able to speak to people. And I literally just showed up in town. I drove there with my sister. We got out of our car. There was not many houses left. We would knock on the door. We would say hello. I would introduce myself, ask some questions. And it was so nice that people were open to speaking to me. Not everybody wanted to be on camera. So there's mm -hmm. people who live in Kandahar, Saskatchewan, who chose not to be part of the film, and that's fine. Yeah. Um, but Dennis and Charlotte were some of the first people I met. So it was nice that they agreed to be in the film. And they were like so natural, like yeah. in front of camera. I'd be like, I was like, okay, how, you'd be like, how how is that possible? Is it like as a filmmaker, do you do you find that like like easy to find people like feel comfortable in front of camera? Because those those people, I mean, like so comfortable. You know, I think one of the important things to do as a documentary filmmaker is to spend time with the people that you want to interview. So I went there two or three times without cameras. Mm -hmm. And each time I'd visit with them, we talk, I would I mean, the first time I did take a camera just to shoot a little bit, but it was sort of important to get to know them also and to be comfortable with them. So they would trust you a little bit in the shooting and the kinds of questions you would ask. So I think that them being comfortable on cameras also because they are comfortable with me. So I that think it takes a little bit of work to get your subjects to sort of <laughs> warm up to you and be able to to relax and answer your questions. And, you know, you make so many requests of them. Sometimes they feel so stupid because you're like, can you walk over here and pretend that you're looking at a flower, you know? Mm. Yeah, so you, it was nothing yeah. suddenly you just go with camera. Hey, no. how do you feel? Yeah, <laughs> Yeah. no, that would be a whole other film. <laughs> yeah. How how hard was it that you were the director of that? I mean, like, you were the star of the the, the documentary you're narrating and you are directing how hard was that sometimes that's really hard because sometimes you're in a scene and then you're kind of having a thought you know I'm with my family the cameras are on us and I'm thinking about something and I would love to be able to tell the camera man to do something differently or to like move over there but I can't because I'm in the scene and you yeah. can't break it because you're in the middle of a conversation or something so sometimes that was a bit hard so you have to keep switching between your filmmaker hat and your sort of subject in the film hat. So you kind of go between these two sometimes, and that was a bit harder. Um, but I kind of enjoyed it as well. 
at times because it was great to be like, okay, I'm going to set up this shot and then I forget about it because I'm going to be <laughs> concentrating on this over here. So yeah, I think it takes yeah. a bit of putting on your one hat all the time versus the other. Actually, it was obvious that you are enjoying, you know, you are enjoying to be on that scene and, you know, you're, you, I mean, you feel like I think comfortable enough that you, this is going to be great and that's it. Is it true? <laughs> yeah. I not think that, Zora, because there were moments where I was like, I don't know if this is going to be great. <laughs> oh, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was one of the well document. As I told you, you were like Shahzad. You were just like narrating this like documentary very well, and that was just very. I mean, like it was. I was just impressed by how well you know documentary started to the end, and it was not only single moment that was like okay, it was too much or like it's too less or something. It was everything was just perfect. I mean, oh my god! Thank you for saying that. Girl. I'm so glad that you enjoyed it like that. <laughs> I did. Um, we have a question here from uh, Kennelly Pellet here. I hope I'm uh, pronouncing right. It says, what advice would you give your young POC, specifically a woman who is, who is aspiring to become a filmmaker? That's such a good question. Mm, I think that, you know, in this particular moment in time, I think I would really encourage people, especially POC women, to tell stories about something that you know or that you, something that you care about. And I don't think that has to be necessarily your community, for sure, but it could be, you know, that is one aspect. I think if you've never made a film before, make a film about something you know, because mm -hmm. it'll make you comfortable. And if there's something about that sort of particular um interest that you want to communicate at least you know it well and you can you know and i think it's important to make to also know that the first film you make doesn't have to be a masterpiece it's called a trade you do learn and you become better and not every film is the same anyways so also to be forgiving on yourself if your first film isn't perfect but i do think also you know, I wish I could say that the industry is great for women now it's not there are some initiatives that are trying to equal the playing field but I think it's become better and it's better than it has been in the past in some ways to be a woman in this industry and to be a woman of color. So I think you should not let that hold you back. But if you can see that as an asset, that's really important. Really think about how it gives you strength and how it gives you a point of view of what you can do, you know. So I think that's really important to think about that you being a woman of color and you being a woman is is great. It gives you it gives you a perspective that a white man does not have, <laughs> or that <laughs> a white woman doesn't have. So just really own that and tell your stories from that perspective. That was a great question, and I love how you said that. Make a film about something that you're comfortable and you know, and you're attached if it's your to. First it's film. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. If it's the first film you're making or the first couple of films you're making, I think because you want to be able to explain to someone that you're asking for money, if you're applying for a grant or whatever else, why it is that you should be that person to make the film. And if it's something that you know well and that you have access to, then of course you are the right person to make that film. I love that. Yeah. And Cindy Hansen in Facebook also, she said, great to see women, women filmmakers. Yeah, it is actually. I find it really inspiring. I agree with you, Cindy. I always love recommending films by women. I pay particular attention to watching films by women. So yeah, I think it's certainly inspiring for me as well. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, like I should have talked a little bit more. I mean, I was so amazed by all these things and I forgot that, oh, you are a woman, you are a woman filmmaker and well, you are a woman <laughs> of color and, you know, all these things. Uh, and then still you are making something that, uh, you know, touch all our all hearts, regardless of like, you know, ethnicity or like race or women mm. or men. I mean, like that was very interesting that if do you have any other, any kind of movie that it's about women? I mean, like, I've made like that, that. That I've made that I've made in particular that are just women. Yeah. Hmm. That's a good question. I have. I've made a short film about um, a woman who <laughs> who plays bridge, and it's about her bridge club. And there is there are all these old ladies that are like in the seventies, eighties. One was even ninety, and they would get together and they would play bridge, and it was in Peterborough. And the film was about how this 
bridge club that meets once a week has really become sort of something that they've been doing for over 30 years and through marriages, divorce, death, and about how women seek community and how unique that is, you know, and how when you often think about it, women live longer than men. And one of the things, one of the reasons we live longer, I think, is because we're very good at seeking community and seeking help. And like, in a way, the seeing the social outlet was really inspiring for me. And I really wanted to capture a little portrait of it. So that was all about women. And there were 10 of them in the film. <laughs> I love that. I, we have to show this uh, and we have to maybe discuss next time. But uh, Cindy has another question. Who is your favorite filmmaker? That's a very good question. And I don't think I have one favorite, but I have several. And like they always change. So if you ask me next month, Cindy, it'd be somebody else. But for the moment, I just watched Kelly Reichert or Kelly Reichert's new film called First Cow. And I've seen, I think, almost every one of her films. And I have to say that I always love them. They're really weird. They're really interesting characters. So certainly she's one of the people I really love watching. Um, I like some of the films of Sofia Coppola for sure. I think I'd have to mention her. Um, I love documentary filmmakers as well. So I think across the board, I watch a lot of documentary. And um, if I was to think about who are some of my favorites in that realm, I'd say, um, hmm. I mean, there's so many in that that I can't pick one documentary filmmaker. But yeah, I think those are sort of two women that I really love if you're particularly asking about women. I, I like that, yeah. I mean, what is it about like documentary, I mean, like that makes it so special for you? Oh, that's a very good question. I think what I really love about documentary, hmm. You know, I think I really love that you get to spend time with a subject. Making a documentary takes a really long time. This film took me in total five years since I first started thinking about it and then finishing it. But the actual active process of making it took three years. So in those three years, you come back to the story and you stay with it and it develops. And I really love that about documentary. And I kind of like how it's rooted in some form of actuality, you know? It's rooted in the real world, per se. So I think for me, that's very exciting because you can't always determine how it's going to end. So even the ending of my film, I wasn't sure how the film was going to end. So I think that that process of filmmaking and having to stay with it and spend your time with the story and see where it leads you, that for me is exciting in documentary. That was that was interesting. And thank you for the questions. I'm, I'm wondering if there's any more question like in YouTube and in Facebook, but uh, what is the last things that you think that, oh, Thomas, I oh, just wanted I just, to ask, <laughs> I just wanted to wrap it up and say that, what is the last thing that you want people remember about, you know, Afghanistan? Oh, that it's a complex country. I think one of the things that I think really kind of gets under my skin is that I feel like I see a lot of content made about Afghanistan that feels like it's about the same two, three subjects. And that it's a very complex country with people that have positive stories and happiness and humor, but they also have tragedy and there's drama and there's war. So I think I really like it when you get to see Afghanistan represented in more complex ways because I'm really tired of the one note representation of where I'm from. Oh, I can talk to you like hours and hours. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I thank, I'm, thank you to all our listeners and viewers and Thomas for this uh, brilliant opportunity that, that you gave me and I really enjoyed it. Yeah, no, thanks. I really appreciate it too. And I didn't want to interrupt. I actually just also wanted to say I really like that scene when you're talking about the, the um, monuments and showing the different examples and the way that your family talked about certain um, examples that really resonated with them. And I think that goes to that point of, of I guess, broadening how, uh, how these stories can be told. So yeah, uh, yeah. thank yeah. you for saying that. But thank you so much to, to both of you for this discussion. This was amazing. And yeah, I do also wish you could go on uh, longer. <laughs> and I think we will have the opportunity in the future to, to revisit. And hopefully uh, it will be a part two or uh, <laughs> follow up there. Back. We'll have another discussion. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Sequel. Well, yeah. Thank you to both of you. Thank you, Thomas, for the invitation and Zora for the conversation. I love speaking to you. So I hope we do it again. For sure. Thank you. And made in Saskatchewan.
Whoa, <laughs> I'm always like a, a live advertise for Saskatchewan. <laughs> so I'll just uh, let everyone know that if you haven't had a chance to see the both films, uh, either Breadwinner or um, Kind of Hard Way, you can find those both on CBC Gem. Uh, and uh, you'll also find this talk um, on our uh, website, on YouTube and on Facebook. So you can revisit as well. But yeah, and uh, we will have more uh, CGR CJTR presentations coming up next month as well. So awesome. I hope you can join us then. But yes. Thanks very much and thank we'll you. see you soon. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.